This is a program from the Wapaka Area Public Library. Welcome. Welcome to the Lunch and Learn. Um, we're, okay, Burrington is going to be presenting 100 Years of Women Casting the Ballot. It should be a really awesome presentation. Um, we do have a couple announcements before. Um, there is a game that we're going to begin with on the Chromebooks. And so if you would like to join in the game, um, make sure that you click on Ready to Join right before the game begins. Uh, other announcements, um, hearing loop, we do have hearing loop accessibility in this room, so if you can benefit from that, by all means, um, use the loop with your hearing aid. Uh, we're going to ask that you please silence your cell phones or turn them off during the presentation. Um, and I'll also ask that if anybody can help with stacking chairs on the rolling carts at the end of the presentation, that would be very helpful. Um, there is um, a box in the back uh, for uh, a free will offering for the lunch and just so you know that goes back into the friends of the library and it helps to support these programs um, a couple of things coming up this week so this Thursday on the 14th at 6 p.m. we have aroma therapy benefits by Jamie and Jamie is an RN and she has extensive um, additional education and aroma therapy studies so that should be a really good program on the 3rd of December, we have the third in our local authors trilogy. Uh, Jane Myra will be coming in and talking about her book and self-publishing. And, and she's here. Yep. And she's here, and she's here <laughs> in the audience. Um, and also, let's see, uh, we've got on Saturday the 16th in the um, textile exhibit room, learn to knit and spin so if you get time and if you haven't seen that textile exhibit make it a point to see it it is really a great exhibit um, so I, that's all the announcements I have so now we'll present Peg thank you can you hear me is my mic working you can hear me okay that's great um, so I'm going to be talking to, about the women's right to vote and one of the things we thought might be fun to use technology with this is to start with a game and so the game is called Kahoot and hopefully you're all set for that um, so it looks like it is do we have I have four three one two five how many tables do we have eight eight okay so maybe we want to get a few more people online. We're just getting some nicknames back here. Okay, sounds good. I can scroll down so you can see all of those names. Oh, we've got colors. There we go. We have six teams so far. It's table seven's on. Just looking for table eight, it looks like. Okay, we're all online. So we're going to get started. Five questions. Are you ready? All right, what rights in the wi did women in the Victorian era lack? Waiting for one more answer. <laughs> All right. So the right to vote, of course. Um, <laughs> 
And of course they didn't have the right to vote or the right to own property or the right to bring forth a legal suit or the right to drive a car because there weren't any. So let's go to the next one. Yeah, so table seven uh, got that the fastest. So here's true or false. The Seneca Falls Convention was held in New York in 1848 and launched the women's suffrage movement. Five, six, seven. One more. <coughs> Somebody said false. <laughs> it, it was that, uh, the Seneca Falls Convention. And you can see that um, table seven is still up there at the top. So it has to, the scoring has to do with not only the right answer, but how quickly you answer. So let's try again. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a leader in, the women, in women's rights. Who are her fellow compatriots? There may be more than one right answer. <laughs> okay, so obviously Lady Gaga was not there, but Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass were all the correct answers on that. And look at that, table seven still. Oh, table four is right behind them. Another question. The Declaration of Sentiments contains uh, 19 facts illustrating the extent of women's oppression. True or false? One more table. All right, that is true. And let's see who's the winner here. Oh my goodness, table four took over table seven's lead. All right. Last question. What women's right was adopted when it was written into the first constitution of California in 1849? <laughs> There's the last one. Okay, it is We Married Women's Property Act. So let's see who's in the lead here. And table one came out on top. Good job. All right. Thanks for participating in that. That was fun. And we'll get started now with our program. Having the right to vote guarantees you a voice. The Constitution does not guarantee the right to vote. Rather, it states that we cannot be denied the right to vote. The Founding Fathers, white men, gave the decision of the vote to the individual states. In the first U.S. election held in 1789, only white men over the age of 18 who owned property were allowed to write the right to vote. This is only about 6% of our new nation. In 1790, a new voting law was passed and any free white person of good character, and male, of course, was allowed to vote. So when I started doing research for this talk, I began to think about all of the uh, really strong women in my family. My paternal grandmother was born in 1906. By the time she was voting age, women had the right to vote. She was very hands-on, and when she was doing something like 
putting up wallpaper or sewing a coat or baking bread, she would pull up a chair and we would be right there with her um, participating in all that. When she was in her 70s, she decided to go back to school. And first she had to get her GED because she'd never graduated from high school. So she enrolled in, in community college. And um, she took all kinds of classes. Everything fascinated her. But one thing she concentrated on was painting. And so she became our own Grandma Moses. And my mom still has uh, one of her pictures hanging in her home. She was so proud when she graduated. She was even written up in the paper as one of the oldest graduates. My grandmother bore eight children. One of them died at an early age. <clears throat> I remember having a conversation with her when I was pregnant with my first child. She shared that she would have had fewer children if she'd had a choice. Life was hard. They didn't live in a farm where children, many children, would have made life easier. And she really believed in women's reproductive rights, even though the Pope would not have agreed. This was the sign on my mother's front door. She recently replaced it with, I vote for Democrats. Pretty much raised by her, her grandmother, Veronica. Her mother died when she was three, and Veronica took on that role as mom. And then her mother, her father was married to a woman. Uh, she would have made the Cinderella stepmother look uh, like fairy godmother. My mother, whose passion was food, was not allowed to cook in, my step, in her stepmother's home. She was pretty much on her own at age 18 and didn't have an opportunity to go to college. Um, so when the four of us were growing up, I had three sisters, we, had, and we were all born within five years, so four girls in five years. And she always told us that we were going to go to college and that we could be anything we wanted to be. I remember she worked the polls. She was a member of the League of, of Women Voters. She ran for school board, and she was our greatest advocate when we were in schools. It's appropriate that my parents chose to retire in Wyoming. Breaking Through is a sculpture that features a cowgirl riding a horse, breaking through a brick wall. And it's a testament to the gains the state has made for and with women. My mom is so proud of that statue. She shares it with all the visitors. So once I started looking for things in history and the history of women's vote, I found some things everywhere I looked that seems like I came up with another resource. So this one is C is for cowboy, and it's a Wyoming alphabet. So on F, it describes F stands for the first governor. Ms. Nellie Taylor Ross, and furthermore, the equality state has something to note. Women, Wyoming was the first to let women vote. In 1924, Ms. Mrs. Tel Nellie Taylor Ross was elected governor after her husband, the former governor, died. Also, she was appointed the first woman director of the U.S. Mint in Washington, D.C. in April of 1933, and she lived to be 101 years old. On December 10, 1869, the Equality State passed a law that gave women the right to vote. At the time, no other state or territory gave women this right. The men who voted for this law thought it would encourage more women to come to move to Wyoming, which had a ratio of six men for each woman. So then we come to my own political story. Uh, my first political memories are as poignant to me as the moonwalk. My father was a scientist, my mother was, a, was an activist. So I remember this, uh, we went to the McGovern rally at the St. Louis airport, and that's back when airports were fun. Not so much anymore. And I can remember shaking McGovern's hand. And I might be giving away my politics now, but I was raised by my very liberal mother. And my first opportunity to vote was in the 1990, um, was in the 1980 election. Um, so I was going to the Democratic primary, and I had to choose between Jimmy Carter and John Anderson. And with my mother's influence, it was obvious I was not going to be voting for Reagan. My candidate won the primary, but lost the election. 
This, these days I'm more immersed in local politics. You can see me advocating for libraries at city council meetings and I help to grow leaders at the Wapaka leadership with Wapaka County. Um, and I'm an election day volunteer as well. So let's think about, uh, we are a nation of immigrants and with only a small popula population of indigenous people that can trace their roots back more than 600 years. So why did they come? Some were forced to come. They were slaves or they were indentured servants. Some saw opportunities for new life. Some to escape tyranny, to be allowed to have religious freedom. And until 100 years ago, more than half of our country's population were not truly free. They were not given the right to vote. People of color and women. The status of women in the Victorian era was often seen as an illustration of the striking discrepancy between the national power and wealth and appalling social conditions. During the reign of Queen Victoria, women did not have the right to vote, to sue, or to own property. At the same time, women participated in the paid workforce in increasing numbers following the Industrial Re Revolution. Feminist ideas spread among the educated middle classes, discriminatory laws were repealed, and the women's suffrage movement gained momentum in the last years of the Victorian era. Women were seen by the middle class at least as belonging to the domestic sphere, and this stereotype required them to provide their husbands with a clean home, to put food on their tables, and to raise their children. Women's rights were extremely limited in this era losing ownership of all their wages, all their physical property, um, and all other cash they generated once they were married. When a Victorian man and woman married, the rights of the women were legally get granted over to the spouse. And under the law, the married couple became one entity represented by the husband, placing in him in control of all property, earnings, and money. In addition to losing money and material goods to their husband, Victorian wives became property to their husbands, giving them the rights to what their bodies produced, children, sex, and domestic labor. Rights and privileges of Victorian women were limited, and both single and married women had to live with hardships and disadvantages. Vic Victorian women were discouraged, were disadvantaged both financially and sexually, enduring inequalities within their marriages and societies. There were sharp distinctions between men's and women's rights during this era. Men were allotted more stability, financial status, and power over their homes and women. Marriages for Victorian women became contracts, which were extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get out of during the Victorian era. Women's rights groups fought for equality and over time made strides in attaining rights and privileges. However, many Victorian women endured their husband's control and even cruelty, including violence, verbal abuse, and economic deprivation, with no way out. While husbands participated in affairs with other women, wives endured infidelity as they had no rights to divorce on those grounds and divorce was considered a social taboo. Because of high birth rates and improving life expectancy, Victorian families were generally large. The growth of residential domestic service even low down the social scale and the prevalence of lodgers, especially in towns, meant that many households were fur further swollen in size and complex in formation. There was a tendency, especially in textile districts, for grandparents to live in households containing young children, particularly where mothers were working outside the home. Many households were dependent upon female earnings, especially those households run by widows. Young people, especially young women, migrated to towns and cities in search of work as the possibilities of agricultural employment declined. Migration was facilitated by family and other connections, creating towns and cities through local connections of religious, regional, or familial groups, and by the possibility of finding accommodation through lodging or domestic service in the homes of contacts. Many households necessarily drew income from a number of sources with many women and juveniles adding to wage earning, even if their employment was usually intermittent and low paid. 
Although the male breadwinner wage was increasingly regarded as the ideal and even the norm, in practice many households were dependent upon female earnings, especially those households run by widows. As the mid-Victorian boom got underway and the demand for female and juvenile labor expanded, particularly where new technologies or patterns existed, they were resented by skilled men. Cheap female and immigrant labor was often used to undercut male workers. Urbanization cre created opportunities for female employment despite the regulation of hours and conditions of work for women and juveniles in certain sectors. And then, of course, in 1871, juveniles were required to go to school. Thus, women in Victorian society in the two-thirds of the population below the upper and middle classes worked for wages. So let's talk a little bit about local. locally. We did have an impact of non-voting women in our community, and these were mostly women of privilege. So in the late 1800s, women came together to form a club called the Women's Club in Wapaka. And they were 15 women and they had two goals. One was to support the social and intellectual development of women and to establish a free public library. So it was through their efforts that Andrew Carnegie um, was contacted and, and a grant was obtained that allowed the library to be constructed on South Main Street in 1913. Nationally, the women's movement was taking steps to formalize the request for increased rights. The Seneca Falls Convention was the first women's rights convention in the United States. Held in July 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York, the meeting launched the women's suffrage movement, much more, which more than seven decades later ensured women the right to vote. We're going to stop here and we're going to play another little game. Let's see how we do on this one. All right. So we're going to go team mode. All right, so we're going to plug in the number. Can we help with that? 74055. Can we get to that? Let's just go back and see if we can. part. Where do we want to be? Okay. Can you help us? Just turn it around. Got table eight. Good job. I wonder if we can turn the music off. We'll cut off the music. <laughs> cut out the music. You got it? <laughs> you have to have a team name. There we go. Table three? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a new game, so. Can we remember? Yep. Oh, good. Who else? Okay, I'm going to help. Cool. Okay, we've got three of them. Without the music, that's a little better. Okay. Seven. Okay. Seven. Four. 
Two more. Okay, we've got seven teams. <clears throat> Almost eight. Do we like the music or do we want the music to be not a part of this? Okay, no music. All right, we've got our eight teams. Good. We're going to do it without, without sound this time. You just get to listen to me instead of that obnoxious music. Okay. Five questions. Are you ready? Which state had women's right to vote first? If you were listening, you'll get this one quickly. Hint, it wasn't Wisconsin. <laughs> All right, you guys really are good listeners. Yes, it was eight. And let's see who's ahead here. Well, oh, there's our media. All right. And then we can see that table four has taken the lead. Next question. In 1869, the Territory of Wyoming passed laws granting women the right to vote. And what other right? I love the picture here. <laughs> One more. <clears throat> All right. So the right to hold office was correct. Um, the right to work, they had that anyway. The right to, to sue, they weren't granted that. The right to drive, we didn't have cars yet. So let's take a look at that. That's fun. All right, next. And it looks like table four is in the lead. Right, next one. Former slave sword, sword turned abolitionist and women's right activist, Sojourner Truth delivered what famous speech? Okay, so it looks like um, the, ain't I a woman is the correct answer. We had a lot of people thinking it was the abolition speech. We got to show the media for this one because it's fun. There she is, Sojourner Truth. And let's see who's ahead, table four. All right, four out of five. How did bicycles help to boost the women's rights movement? Okay, two more. Everybody's in. Six. Seven. One more. Yeah. Maybe it has to give you a score because we have seven answers. Is there anyone who has not yet answered the question? It's gonna time's gonna go up. All right, time's up. 
and increased women's mobility and autonomy um, and altered women's mode of dress. So the only thing it didn't do, well, although that's debatable, beautified women by giving them bicycle face when they rode. And we'll learn a little bit more about that in a minute. You could. Yep, they were both correct. And table four is still in the lead. And here's the last one. In what ways can you celebrate and honor the hard-won rights of women? All right, and they were all correct. So any of you, if you, whatever you answered, it was the correct answer. Um, so let's see, uh, let's show the media for that one. There we go, on modern day voting. And let's see who won on that. Table four, congratulations. All right. And back to our presentation. Originally known as the Women's Rights Convention, the Seneca Fall Convention fought for the social, civil, and religious rights of women. The meeting was held in July 1848 in the, at the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls, New York. And despite scarce publicity, 300 people, mostly women, showed up. On the first day, only women were allowed. And on the second day, they said the men could come in. <laughs> Um, so the Declaration of Sentiments was the one document that was drafted for the Women's Rights Convention. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the author of that. And it described women's grievances and demands, and it called on women to fight for their constitutionally guaranteed right to equality as a U.S. citizen. Um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton was one of the meeting's organizers and author of the Declaration. She began with a speech on the Convention's goals and purpose. We are assembled to protest against a form of government existing without the consent of the governed, to declare our right to be free as man is free, to be represented in the government which we are taxed to support, to have such disgraceful laws as give men the power to chastise and imprison his wife, to take the wages which she earns, the property which she inherits, and in case of separation, the children she loves. The vote for the Declaration passed unanimous, unanimously, except for the Ninth Reso Resolution. Does anybody know what the ninth, re ninth Resolution was? Which demanded the right to vote. That was the only one that was contentious. And um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, an African-American abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, gave impassioned speeches about why this was important to be uh, able to vote, and it did eventually, but just barely passed. So we have this idea that the suffrages, the suffragettes, were all about the votes for women, and yet in this very first convention, they were undecided on whether that's really what they wanted. And the men in power at that time were afraid of what women might decide, because they could upset the status quo. So the women who organized the convention were active in the abolitionist movement, which called for the emancipation of slaves and the end of racial discrimination. So that was their main goal. They were really talking about rights for all humans, not just rights for women. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, the document stated. Inspired by the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Sentiments asserted women's equality in politics, family, education, jobs, and morals. The Declaration began with 19 abuses and usurpations that were destined to destroy a woman's confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. Women were forced to submit to laws which they did not consent. 
and women were denied an education and issued an inferior role in the church. Now this is, what, this is something else I came across. Every time I turned around I was finding some other little piece of information. So this um, book was uh, given to us by one of our library patrons. It's called At the Heart of Texas and it's a hundred years of the Texas State Historical Association. So as I was leafing through it I found this part about lady members. And it said, uh, public meetings in those days, and it's talking about 1897, were thought of as men's meeting. The only meetings where women properly belonged, as a matter of course, were church meetings. It goes on to say that despite this, there were some women who had a lot of knowledge about certain subjects, and they were allowed to be a part of the historical society because of their knowledge and expertise. The uh, declaration went on to say, in light of these abuses, um, it called women to throw off such government to, man to demand to be regarded as men's equal. And the resolutions called on Americans to regard any laws that placed women in an inferior position to men as having no force or authority. They resolved for women to have equal rights within the church and equal access to jobs. So some of the key figures in the movement, we've talked a little bit about Elizabeth Cady Santon, and she was the author, the main author of the Declaration of Sentiments, and one of the movers and shakers in the women's movement. Um, but there were other people who were assisting with that. It wasn't a lone person. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, um, she was a Quaker, born into a Quaker family and she was committed to social justice for all people and she actually collected anti-slavery petitions, signatures on petitions at the age of 17. Also we talked a little bit about Frederick Douglass. He was um, an abolitionist. He uh, escaped from slavery in Maryland and became a national leader of the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts and New York. And he was noted for his ability to incite people to act and to move on some of the things that he talked about. And then of course we have Sojourner Truth. And she is very famous for her speech, Ain't I a Woman? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man, when I could get it, and bear the lash as well, and ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most of them sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me, and ain't I a woman? In the late 1800s, labor leaders such as Lenora Berry and Eva Valesh interviewed women workers to expose conditions they faced on the job. Um, journalist Helen Campbell conducted similar investigations in tenement housings, publishing women's household budgets to show affluent readers what women were faced with. And author Dorothy Richardson went undercover to work in dangerous and low-paid industries and reported her experiences in The Long Day. And this was originally published in 1905, available from our library. So you may want to check that one out. So the Married Women's Property Acts helped to rectify some of the difficulty that women faced. Previously, laws were based on the English common law system that restricted married, women, married women's ability to own property, to keep their wages, to enter into contracts, and otherwise act autonomously to their husband's authority. So after New York passed their Married Women's Property Law in 1848, this law became the template for other states um, to grant married women the right to own property. 
And we've already talked about Wyoming Territory, and they were way ahead of their time. In 1869, the legislature of the Territory of Wyoming passed America's first suffrage law allowing women the right to vote and to hold office. And in 1890, Wyoming is the 44th state admitted to the Union and became the very first state to allow women the right to vote. And technology really um, acted in some way to make women more mobile, to give them a freedom of dress that they didn't have before. And so I want to share this um, little video with you about that. And I'll turn the sound on so we can hear that. Yeah, where's my sound? I lost my edge here. Yeah. Technology, you love it when you can use it. I don't know where my sound went. Usually it's hanging out down here at the bottom. You minimize your window to okay. your computer. The whole thing? Yeah, yep. just click on the line. This one? There we there go. go. Yep, now we're going to get some sound here. Thanks, Patsy. Try not to blast you too much. When you think of the fight for women's rights, you probably think of pivotal figures such as Jane Addams, Susan B. Anthony, there we go. and Sojourner Truth. But squarely in the center of this battle was one tool that completely changed the game. Susan B. Anthony said that it did more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. That tool was the bicycle. To understand how, you first have to understand the bicycle craze of the late 1800s. By the mid-19th century, the ordinary, or penny farthing, was the most common kind of bicycle. It was named that because its vastly different wheel sizes resembled the coin currency of the day. A penny and a farthing. Got it. You may have seen examples of these in Victorian illustrations or at your local steampunk meetup. Aside from looking completely ridiculous, these bikes were unwieldy, difficult to operate, <laughs> and actually super dangerous. Because of the unstable center of gravity, hitting even the smallest bump in the road could send a rider over the front in what was affectionately referred to as a header. They were also difficult for women to ride. It turns out it's virtually impossible to ride a penny farthing while wearing the giant hoop skirts that were in fashion at the time. Then in 1885, a man came along named John Kemp Starley, who said he felt the time had arrived for solving the problem of the cycle. He released his invention, the Rover Safety Bicycle, which was basically the first incarnation of what we now consider the modern bicycle. It had two 26-inch wheels, a diamond-shaped frame, and a rear-drive chain system. Bikes became smaller, safer, and more practical, and guess what? America f***ing loved them. Men and women alike flocked to these noiseless steeds and droves. In 1897 alone, over 2 million bicycles were sold. Even though these new modern bicycle designs were becoming enormously popular, and the drop frame construction did make it safer and easier to ride, biking in a big flowing skirt still sucked. At that time, many women dressed in voluminous skirts with lots of slips underneath and ruffles, and, <laughs> and that was not practical on a bicycle. The new bicycle craze helped usher in a rational dress movement among women which advocated moving away from uncomfortable, restrictive dresses. Bloomers, baggy undergarments that were more comfortable and practical than hoop skirts, were popular in the 1850s. With the growing popularity of bicycles, though, in the late 19th century, they came back with a vengeance and were adopted by prominent suffragists of the time. These changes were threatening to some men, though, and many viewed women wearing pants as somehow depraved or immoral. <laughs> For some reason, some men were not happy with the idea of women wearing bifurcated garments. Doctors also chimed in, warning about potential health risks for female cyclists like depression, heart palpitations, as well as something called bicycle face. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Blushed, pale, it could result in dark shadows on their eyes. Still, none of this deterred women. In 1894, after hearing two wealthy Boston men bet $10,000 that a woman couldn't travel around the globe on a bicycle, Annie Londonderry, a 5'3", 100-pound housewife that had never ridden a bike before, took on the challenge. And with only a pearl-handled revolver and change of underwear, braved the desert, <laughs> wars, and collisions with pigs on her journey around the world, which she completed in 1895. 
Five. This mass adoption of bicycles significantly helped the feminist movement of the day. It changed the modes of dress and gave women increased mobility, but more importantly, it gave them a sense of autonomy. In 1890, just five years after the introduction of the safety bicycle, the National American Woman Suffrage Association was formed with the express purpose of lobbying state to state for women's right to vote. Two of its founders, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, are quoted as saying that woman is riding the suffrage on the bicycle. And that's exactly what they did in 1920. So oh, that one's fun. So yes, bicycle face was a real thing. Doctor said so. So you know it's got to be true, right? The other part of that is that um, persuasive testimony was something that they used to tell women's stories. And we do that today, too. When we're talking about something that we feel passionate about, that story means so much more if it comes from an individual. And so the, the persuasive testimony, especially the book I mentioned, The Long Day, was part of that. And today we celebrate the, the right to vote. After 72 years of organized struggle, all American women finally achieved the same rights as men at the polling box when in 1920, women got the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. However, not everyone was treated equally. While white women were granted the right to vote, there were still barriers in place for people of color. Barriers were set to keep black people from voting, intimidation, and poll taxes were common. During the 60s, within my lifetime, less than 60 years ago, people of color fought for voting rights, and in 1964, an amendment was adopted that outlawed states from using a poll tax in a federal election, and that did not prevent states from charging a poll tax for local elections. It wasn't until 1928 with the Equal Franchise Act that women were given the same rights as men uh, with all over 21 year olds able to vote. So how can you celebrate and honor hard won rights? Well, first of all, I would suggest that you make sure you're registered and you can actually check or register right at the, um, oh, let's go into the internet so we can get there from here. So there's a My Vote Wisconsin. This is a website where you can register to vote. You can find out if you're registered to vote. I recommend that you go there, encourage your friends and family members to make sure that they are on the registry. And you can also go across the hall to City Hall. If you um, live in the city of Wapaka, if you live outside, please find your town hall and make sure that you're registered. You also want to become and stay informed about the issues that matter to you, the things that you care about. Find a reliable source. Make sure you're getting your news media from something that's not heavily one-sided or other-sided. Hold civil conversations with your family, with your friends, with people that you meet, with people at the library. And use the library resources, because that's why we're here. We're your library. <coughs> and then I just have um, one other um, one other little snippet of video that I wanted to share with you, which is from the, the trailer for the Suffragette film that came out a couple of years ago. Make sure that. You work at the Glass House Laundry. Oh. How's Boone? Part time washer at seven. Full time from one up to twelve. <laughs> Defy this government. Vote for women! 
artificial cut into the heart of communications. My job is to enforce the law. Who means nothing to me? I've had no say in making the law. We have reached a state of anarchy we can no longer ignore. Punish those responsible, whatever way you can. We'll stop you. What are you going to do? Lock us all up? We're in every home, we're half the human race, you can't stop us all. We do not want to be lawbreakers. We want to be lawmakers. The only way is forward. I'm worth no more, no less than you. Never surrender. Never give up the fight. Yeah. How many have seen Suffragette? A few. Um, there are copies available in InfoSoup, so I do recommend that you do that. Let's see. We live in a great nation where people are allowed to use their freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and the right to assemble to put the principles they hold dear in the spotlight. Early advocates felt strong conviction that women's rights are human rights. Questions for me? Diane. Yeah. There's another film about the um, suffragist movement in the United States, Iron Jaw Angel. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think it was produced in 2004. Jack probably knows everything. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in there, and I have seen that one, and that one's really good. People do not remember. No way in here. People died. Yes. I mean, they were. Yeah. And it, it wasn't just our country either. I mean, the suffragette film takes place in in Great Britain, and they were experiencing the same things. But yes, they were put in jail. There was violence. There was violence perpetrated by women too, because they felt so strongly about it. It wasn't just violence towards women. So it was a struggle, and we're there. So let's make sure we use that. Yes. Back in 1994, when it was the 75th anniversary of the uh, 19th Amendment, the Wapaka branch of the American Association of University Women marched in the 4th of July parade down Main Street here. Cool. We all wore white. We sang suffragette songs and had a great time. I wish there were a video about that. That would have when been I great. Back, when I went back and found my family to sit down and to watch the rest of the parade, my daughter-in-law, now they, they would have been in their early 30s, one of her friends looked at me and she said, why were you marching? Women have always been able to vote. <laughs> and I just looked at her and said, no, they haven't always In our lifetime. <laughs> in our lifetime. <laughs> in our lifetime. Yeah, it hasn't been that long. Yeah. Early 30s. Absolutely. And really, you know, our rights have been um, fought for, but there are still people who are marginalized in our country. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.